الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن I welcome you all with the greetings of peace and mercy السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته a very warm welcome to the Dhul Hijjah special exclusive youth program. I hope and pray you are all set for these brilliant upcoming 10 days full of barakah. For how can we not plan for this excellent golden opportunity? Indeed, this Dhul Hijjah gift is Allah's special gift showered on us for those who plan, for those who prepare, for those who yearn for his pleasure, for those who strive to please him, and for those who want to be amongst the sabiqun. And we pray we are ranked amongst the foremost when the day will be at its hardest. We pray we will be under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shade. Ameen. Without further ado, let's dive into the program specially designed for you. So let me just tell you our schedule. Inshallah, I will start with the 21 virtuous deeds that could be done in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Then Hadi, I will take over with the next. But before we start, my dear sisters, may I request you and myself for two things. Number one is to purify our intentions. And number two is if you could, if you could please invite at least three sisters from your contact list for this program, so that it could be a source of sadiqa jariya for all of us. So I hope you all have done that. Today, inshallah, we will be speaking on the 21 virtuous deeds that could be done on the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Afdalu ayyam dunya You know, after Ramadan left us, many of us felt that dip in our iman. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with another golden opportunity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no good deeds done on other days are superior to those done on these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Then some companion asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not even jihad? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, not even jihad, except that of a man who does it by putting himself and his property in danger for Allah's sake and does not return with any of those things. The Prophet sallallahu also said, Afdalu ayyam dunya al ashr The best 10 days are these 10 days. Just like the last 10 days of Ramadan are the best 10 nights of the year. Similarly, these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are the best days of the year. And yes, they are, they are better than the days of Ramadan. And these are the most beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they combine acts of worship and the reward is amplified for all good deeds during these blessed 10, during these blessed 10 days in a way that is unlike any other time. So the questions we should be asking ourselves are, how do we make the most of this season of blessings? What deeds can I perform to attain his pleasure and raise my ranks in his sight? How can I get closer to him Azza wa Jal in these blessed 10 days of the year? So let's start with the first deed, Hajj. Definitely Hajj is one of the best deeds that one can do during these 10 days. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever performs Hajj and does not commit any obscenity and wrongdoing, he or she will come out as the day he or she was born, pure and sinless. The Prophet Sallallahu said, a mabroor Hajj, complete and accepted, has no reward for it but Jannah. However, for those of us who are not invited to his house this year, we sincerely pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes our names amongst those who he calls the next year. Ameen, Ya Rabb. But there are still many more ways to earn his rida and his pleasure. 
So let's hold on and grab the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with and make the most out of them. We do not know if we'd be alive the next year to witness these blessed 10 days. So we have to make the most of them now, inshallah. Point number two is fasting. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who fasts for one day for Allah's pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep his face away from the hellfire for a distance covered by a journey of 70 years. We really need to ponder on this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who fasts for one day for Allah's pleasure, Allah will keep his face away from the hellfire for a distance of 70 years. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ also said, every good deed of Adam's son is for him, except fasting. It is for me, and I will reward him for it. One of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah allows us to combine intentions or that we would attain the reward when combining intentions for multiple, for multiple voluntary good deeds. What does that refer to? So within a voluntary good deed, you can make multiple intentions that can make the reward greater, inshallah. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned two reasons for fasting on Mondays. One is because the deeds are presented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on this day. And the second, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on this day. So while you fast these 10 days, and there is a Monday or a Thursday, for example, then you can fast these 10, these 10 days with the intention of it being the first 10 days of the Hijjah, as well as a Monday and a Thursday. And inshallah, this would amplify your reward. Now coming specifically to the ninth of the Hijjah, that is the day of Arafah. Laylatul Qadr is the greatest night of the year. Similarly, the day of Arafah is the greatest day of the year. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no day upon which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala frees more of his servants from the hellfire than the day of Arafah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked about fasting on the day of Arafah, that is the ninth of the Hijjah. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, fasting on the day of Arafah is an expiation for the preceding year and the following year. Imagine sisters, the expiation of two years of sins comes at a very small price. All we have to do is fast on this blessed day of Arafah. So let's try our best not to miss it. Number three is the dhikr and the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are no days on which good deeds are greater or more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than on these 10 days. So recite much of tahleel, la ilaha illallah, takbir, Allahu akbar, Tahmeed, alhamdulillah. In addition to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Hajj, verse number 28, مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ وَيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ That they may witness, that they may witness benefits for themselves and mention the name of Allah on known days over what he has provided for them of sacrifice. Scholars have, have referred to and mention Allah on known days as these 10 days of the Hijjah. The Salaf, the pious predecessors, when they approached these 10 days of the Hijjah, they would increase in saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Hamd. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether you're on your way to class, or whether you're in the market, or whether you're in the mosque or at home, without there being a specific time mentioned, keep reminding yourself and repeating the dhikr constantly. Ibn Umar and Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhuma, they used to go out in the marketplace during the first 10 days of the hijjah reciting takbir, and the people would recite takbir when they heard them. You know, something now as a mother you can do to encourage the family as a whole is, you can firstly set alarms on your phones that can play the takbirat every 15 to 20 minutes, reminding the family to recite it. And secondly, if you have younger kids at home, 
You can also set your kids a challenge or a competition between themselves at home. But the one who reminds the others the most often about the takbirat or the one found reciting the takbirat most often will receive a prize at the end of the 10 days. And you could also do this with the help of a chart. So in this way, you could encourage your kids. The Prophet وسلم, said, whoever revives an aspect of my sunnah that is forgotten after my death, he will have a reward equivalent to that of the people who follow him without it detracting in the least from their reward. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Ahzab, Wasim 41, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu thkuru allaha dhikran kathira. Oh, you have believed? Remember Allah with much remembrance. There is another hadith that totally blows me away. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Should I not inform you of the best of your deed and the purest of them with your master and the highest of them in your ranks? And what is better for you than spending gold and silver and better for you than meeting your enemy and striking their necks and they striking your necks? The companions, they said, of course, please tell us Rasulullah. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just said two words. He said, dhikr Allah the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that's how easy it is. Allah has made it so easy to gain rewards. Are you then going to let go? Are you then going to lose on this great opportunity? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them, make us amongst those who remember him often. Ameen. Why number four? is salat ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is sending blessings on Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi what does this mean? It means that you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking him to send blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Ahzab, verse number 56, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Indeed, Allah sends blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his angels. Oh, you have believed? Send blessings upon him and ask him. Grant him peace. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يُسَلِّمُ عَلَيَّ إِلَّا رَدَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ رُوحِي حَتَّى أَرُدُّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No one sends greetings upon me, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala returns my soul to me so that I may return his greetings. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, Man salla alayya salatin wahidan, sallallahu alayhi ashra salawat. Whoever sends salah upon me once, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will send salah upon him tenfold and will erase ten sins from him and will raise him ten degrees in status. SubhanAllah. Don't we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send blessings on us? Yeah, the sunnah mentions it so very easy. You know, those who are facing difficulties, those who are facing trials in life, increase in your salat on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who have committed sins and wronged themselves and want forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, increase in your salat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why do I say so? It's mentioned in an authentic narration. Once Ubay radiallahu an said, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Indeed, I see a lot of salah upon you. That is, I send a lot of blessings upon you. How much of my salah should I make upon you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As you wish. Ubay radiallahu an said, A fourth, that is, my dhikr, one fourth of it should be salah upon you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as you wish, but if you add more, it will be better for you. Ubaidullah then said, then half. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as you wish, and if you add more, it will be better for you. Ubaidullah then said, then two third. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as you wish, but if you add more, it will be better for you. Ubaidullah then said, should I make all of my salah upon you? That is all of my dhikr sending blessings upon you? He sallallahu alayhi wa said, then all your problems would be solved and your sins would be forgiven. 
Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Number five is dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 60, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord says, fall upon me, I will respond to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 186, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ and when my servants ask you concerning me, indeed, I am near. I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me in obedience and believe in me that they may be rightly guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, he is here, he is right here. All that we have to do is to call out to him. If you walk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will run to you. You have to take the initiative. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that he will respond to you. And that reminds me of the ninth of the hijjah the day of Arafah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Khayru dua, dua yawmi Arafah. The best invocation is that of the day of Arafah. And a number of scholars have mentioned that the best invocation in this hadith is an invocation of any caller in general including those who are on the plains of Arafah in Hajj and those who are not on the plains of Arafah. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued and said, and the best that anyone can say is what I and the prophets before me have said. La ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Some of the Salaf, some of the Salaf would repeat it around 5,000 times a day on this blessed day. We are amongst the chosen ones if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity to live until the day of Arafah. So whatever it is that is, bother, that, that is bothering you, you know, any trial, any difficulty, just pull out your prayer mat and beg to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cry out to him for his mercy and forgiveness. If you are truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sincere in your asking to him, he will definitely make a way out for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Talaq, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And whoever fears Allah, he will make for him a way out and he will provide for him from where he did never expect it. He never expected. And whoever relies upon Allah, then Allah will be sufficient for him. Now inshallah, Sister Hadi Ansari will continue from point number six. Over to you, Hadia. Uh, uh, I will be continuing uh, with my part and also the part that was assigned to Rishda uh, because unfortunately she is unwell. Uh, so let's uh, begin. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al-ma'in. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, before I start uh, the next point, I want to describe a scenario that often plays out in our lives. How many times have you heard the phrase, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be a changed person, or I'm only going to eat healthy from now on, or I'm going to exercise for an hour every day? We've all heard it, and more often than not, we know from experience that the new resolution usually doesn't last very long. Similarly, we often get enthusiastic about doing good deeds and we exhaust all our efforts in the first few days. But as humans, our enthusiasm is erratic and short-lived most of the time. And building a habit requires time and consistent effort. So it's better and it's okay to start small and gradually build up your goals. When Rasulullah was asked, what deeds are most loved by Allah? He sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, the most regular constant deeds, even though there may be few. And he added, don't take upon yourselves except the deeds which are within your, within your ability. So in keeping with the theme for today, let's look at some good habits that we can build in the first 10 days of the hijjah Point six is khushu in salah. 
starting with salah, which is the most important act of worship after tawheed or shahada. We might regularly offer our five prayers every day, but how often do we do it with khushu? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers in Surah Al-Mu'minun, he says, Qad mu'minun. Certainly, the believers have succeeded. Hum fi salatihim khashi'un. Those who are during their prayer, humbly submissive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say those who pray. Rather, those who have khushu' in their prayers. Now, khushu' is a comprehensive term. It is the presence of the heart. It is mindfulness. It is humility before Allah. Ibn Kathir says in the tafsir of this verse, khushu' in prayer happens when a person empties his heart for it and focuses on it to the exclusion of all else and prefers it to everything else. Only then does he find comfort and joy in it. As the Prophet wasallam said, the coolness of my eyes lies in salah. So how can we develop khushu and salah? Now this topic is a vast topic and Sheikh Salih al Munajid covers this topic in detail in his book, 33 Ways of Developing Khushu and Salah. And I would recommend that if you have the time, you read it. However, a few important points he mentions include uh, preparing oneself for prayer by repeating the words of the Adhan, reciting the Adhkar after it, using siwak, wearing good clean clothes, praying at a measured pace, remembering death while praying, pondering over the verses that are being recited, looking at the place of prostration, wearing the surahs recited and praying in a place without many distractions. Now, point seven is an extension of point six. And as we know that we have obligatory prayers and voluntary prayers, and there are a number of voluntary prayers which have great virtues. And this is a wonderful opportunity to become regular with them. These 10 days, can kickstart our goal of becoming regular uh, with our voluntary prayers. Starting with the Sunnah prayers before and after the Fard prayers. And there are 12 rakahs, two rakahs before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, and two after Asha. And Rasulullah said, whoever prays 12 rakahs in a day, a house will be built for him in paradise. The next voluntary prayer that we can strive to become regular with is praying the Hajjid. The practice of Rasulullah was to offer the night prayers and follow it with Witr. And he وسلم, said, the most excellent prayer after that which is obligatory is the voluntary night prayer. Third, we can start praying Witr, which is the last Salah of the night before dawn. According to the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to observe Vidr every night and would even wake her up to pray with her. And it is narrated that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, O people of the Quran, observe Vidr because Allah is Vidr, because Allah is one and he loves Al-Vidr, what is odd numbered. Uh, another voluntary prayer that we can become regular with is praying to rakahs of the duha prayer. And the evidence of this is from the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu where he said, my friend, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa advised me to observe three things. To fast three days a month, to pray to rakahs of duha prayer, and to pray with her before sleeping. Moving on to the next act, uh, we have acts of kindness. Now, the life of Rasulullah has numerous examples of his kindness and compassion to, to those around him. Even small acts of kindness can have a great impact. Rasulullah said, don't consider anything insignificant out of good things, even if it is that you meet your brother with a cheerful countenance. He also said, oh people, exchange greetings of peace, feed people, strengthen the ties of kinship, pray at night while others are asleep, and you will enter Jannah in peace. And what better time to spread kindness than these blessed days? 
It could be as simple as giving a glass of water to your sibling or helping a friend with their homework or removing a harmful object from the road. No matter how insignificant it may seem to you or me, it counts. There is a beautiful hadith about the reward of helping others. The Prophet wasallam said, if anyone relieves a Muslim brother from one of the hardships of this worldly life, Allah will relieve him of one of the hardships of the day of his eruption. If anyone makes it easy for the one who is in debt to him while finding it difficult to repay, Allah will make it easy for him in this life and in the year after. And if anyone conceals the faults of a Muslim, Allah will conceal his faults in this world and in the hereafter. And Allah helps his slave so long as he helps his brother. Think about it for a moment. If you help someone in this world, Allah will help you in this world and the next. And we are all definitely in need of Allah's help. Moving on to point nine, we have seeking knowledge. From the first verse to be revealed that stressed on learning to the promise of Allah to raise those who have been granted knowledge to high ranks, the verses of the Quran remind us again and again about the importance of seeking knowledge. Rasulullah said, whoever follows a path in pursuit of knowledge, Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. No people gather in one of the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah and teaching it to one another, but the angels will surround them. Tranquility will descend upon them. Mercy will envelop them and Allah will mention them to those who are with him. That is the angels, subhanAllah. He also said, he who goes forth in search of knowledge is considered as struggling in the cause of Allah until he returns. In addition, it will get us great rewards even after his death. For whoever leaves behind beneficial knowledge will get rewards as long as people are getting benefits from his knowledge, as reported by Rasulullah. The next deed, point 10, is connecting the ties of kinship. And this is a reminder to myself before anyone else. Many of us are kinder to our friends and accomplices more than we are to our own family be it our parents, siblings, or distant relatives. We tend to overlook their rights on us or merely reciprocate any good we receive. But that's not enough. Rasulullah said, the one who maintains ties of kinship is not the one who reciprocates. The one who maintains ties of kinship is the one who, when his relatives cut him off, maintains the ties of kinship. That's repelling evil with good and taking the higher road. As the rewards of maintaining the ties of kinship, Rasulullah said, anyone who wants to have his provision expanded and his term of life prolonged should maintain ties of kinship. Moving on to point 11, reciting the Quran. Rasulullah said, Man qara'a harfan min kitabillah, falahu bihi hasana. Whoever recites or reads a letter from the book of Allah, he will have a reward. And that reward will be multiplied by 10. I am not saying that alif lam mim is a letter. Rather, I'm saying that alif is a letter, lam is a letter, and mim is a letter. So simply by reciting alif lam mim, Three letters that roll off your tongue so easily, you've gained 30 thawab or more. You've gained at least 30 thawab. And in these 10 days, acts of worship are even more beloved to Allah. So spending your time during these days, spending your time in good deeds, seeking the pleasure of Allah, this is the best bargain you could hope for. Because you put in little effort and gain a great reward. And Rasulullah also said, Verily, the one who recites Quran beautifully, smoothly, and precisely will be in the company of the noble and obedient angels. And as for the one who recites with difficulty, 
stammering or stumbling through, through its verses, then he will have twice the reward. So if you have difficulty reciting the Quran, but you still do it, you will have a greater reward. And as I mentioned earlier, consistency is key. So it's better to recite just half a page or one page every day than a whole juice once in a while. The next point, point number 12, is memorizing the Quran. These 10 days are an opportunity for us to build our relationship with the Quran. You can begin by memorizing the smaller surahs. Make yourself a target that uh, maybe by the end of these 10 days, I will have memorized a juz or a surah. Push yourself to achieve more. And the surahs that you have memorized, you can recite in your salah so that your memorization becomes stronger. The next point, point number 13, is listening to the Quran. This is a very simple deed and does not require any real effort on our part. All you have to do is press play on your phone. You can listen to the Quran when you are doing the dishes, when you're cooking, when you're traveling from one place to another. And listening to the Quran also helps greatly with memorization. So if you're trying to memorize a certain surah or a certain part of the Quran, keep listening to it. That will make it much easier for you to retain that surah. Number 14 is to read the Quran with understanding. And this is perhaps the most important point out of the previously discussed points about the Quran, to try and understand the message of the Quran. What is the objective of the Quran? Why was it revealed? Was it for us to simply keep the Quran on a high shelf where dust gathers on its covers? Was it for us to parrot its verses without really paying attention to its meaning? Was it for us to use only in ceremonies, weddings, funerals, and that's it? What was the purpose behind the revelation of the Quran? And are we fulfilling that purpose? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu qad ja'atkum maw'idatun min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur wa hudan wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. O mankind, there has come to you a direction from your Lord and a healing for, for the diseases in your hearts and a guidance and mercy for the believers. How can we let the Quran be our guide and our healing if we do not even care to understand what it says? How can we call ourselves the people of the Quran if we don't bother to read it with understanding? And I want to put this into perspective. Let's go back in time and look at the Quraysh. Take yourself back in time, 14 centuries ago. The Quran reached the ears of the cruel, tyrannical Arabs and it stirs something, something deep within their souls. These are a people who detest the message of the Prophet. Their hatred for the Messenger of Allah is so strong that they plot by day to end his message and by night to end his life. And not just that, some of them are barbaric people who even bury their daughters alive. Yet these very people, when they hear the Quran, when they hear Rasulullah recite from Surah Al-Najm, they feel a strange allure to the verses. The words strike a chord in their hearts. And despite the bitterness and contempt raging between, within them, they fall on their faces in prostration. These hard-hearted men cannot help but be moved by the beauty of this book and the purity of its message. It gets you wondering, if the Quran had such striking if, if if the Quran had such a striking effect on even the hardest of hearts, why does it not affect mine? How can I read the Quran page after page, day after day, without absorbing its meanings? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Alam yaanin al-ladina amanu an taqshaa qulubhum li dhikr Allah wa ma nazla min al-haq." Isn't it time? For those who believe that their hearts become humbly submissive at the remembrance of Allah, isn't it time for us to humble ourselves before Allah and to ponder over the meanings of his book? We've forgotten the true purpose of this book. We've forgotten that its true purpose is to transform the lives of men. We've put it away 
on the highest shelves as a mark of respect where dust settles on its covers from lack of use. Or perhaps we read it frequently, but without paying much attention to what it really says. If only we let the words of the Quran seep into our hearts. If only we try to implement its teachings. This Dhul Hijjah, don't read the Quran only as a ritual. Ponder over the meaning, meanings of its words. Reflect on the lessons it imparts. Let the Quran heal you and beautify your character and be the source of your strength. Because within its words, you will find guidance to replace error, conviction to replace doubt, and hope to replace despair. And a thing we can do is to study the Quran together as a family or with friends. Try to bond over the verses. You can sit together, pick a passage from the Quran and talk about it together. Read the different tafsir and discuss the meanings of the verses. And this will help you understand the Quran better. Moving on to number 15, we have Tawbah and Istighfar. Making lots of Istighfar. Istighfar is your portal to relief from distress. It opens the doors to risk, to sustenance, to knowledge, to productivity, to goodness. When you are in distress, make istighfar. When you are happy, make istighfar. Keep saying astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, not just as lip service, but with sincerity. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best man, the closest to Allah. His sins, his, his past and future sins were forgiven. And yet, he made istighfar over 70 times a day. How often do we need to make istighfar then? then? How often do we need to seek Allah's, for, uh, uh, Allah's forgiveness? Making istighfar also teaches us humility and reminds us that we are weak and sinful and prone to error. Rasulullah wasallam is reported to have said, من أكثر من الاستغفار جعل الله له من كل هم فرجا ومن كل ضيق مخرجا ورزقه من حيث من حيث لا يحتسب. Whoever makes istighfar frequently, Allah will make for him a way out of every trouble and grant him relief from every distress and will provide him from sources he would never expect. So istighfar is a means to relieve your distress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what Nuh salam said to his people when he was calling them to, to Allah. He said, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا Nuh salam says, I said to them, Seek forgiveness of your Lord, for he is oft forgiving. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He will send down rain to you in abundance. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا and he will give you increase in wealth and children and bestow on you gardens and bestow on you rivers. So Nuh is telling his people that Allah will increase their sustenance. Allah will bless them if they repent to Allah, if they do istighfar. And of course, most importantly, istighfar or tawbah erases sins. But it doesn't just erase sins. If we repent and do righteous deeds, Allah says, he will replace our evil deeds with good ones. Allah says in Surah Al-Furqan, Accept those who repent and believe and do righteous deeds. For those, Allah will change their sins into good deeds. And Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. And Allah Azza wa Jal loves when a servant make tawbah, make istighfar. So much that Rasulullah said, by the one in whose hand my soul is, if you would not commit sins, Allah, will Allah would replace you with the people who would commit sins and seek forgiveness from Allah. And Allah will certainly forgive them. Especially on the day of Arafah, the, the day in which Allah frees so many of his servants from the fire. Let's make the most of this day. Let's make lots of istighfar and ask Allah and beseech him to forgive our sins and save us from the hellfire. I'd like to mention one specific dua for istighfar. This is the dua that Rasulullah wasallam describes as Sayyidul Istighfar, the chief of all duas for forgiveness. 
And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about this dua, if anybody recites it during the day with firm faith in it and dies on the same day before the evening, they will be from the people of paradise. And if anybody recites it at night with firm faith in it and dies before the morning, they will be from the people of paradise. So this dua should be said every morning and evening. And this is the dua, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. O oh Allah, you are my Lord. None has the right to be worshipped except you. Khalaqtani wa ana abduk. You created me and I am your servant. وَأَنَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِكَ وَوَعْدِكَ مَسْتَطَعْتِ I abide by your covenant and promise to honor it as best as I can. أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِ مَا صَنَعْتِ I seek refuge in you from the evil that I have done. أَبُوءُ لَكَ بِنِعْمَتِكَ عَلَيْ I acknowledge your favor upon me. وَأَبُوءُ بِذَنْبِ And I acknowledge my sin. فَغْفِرْ لِي فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ So forgive me. For none can forgive sins except you. This is the Sayyid al istighfar This is the dua that Rasulullah said is the chief of all duas for forgiveness. So let's try to, recite, uh, to read this dua every morning and evening. And the last point that I want to talk about is staying away from sin. Actively and consciously keeping away from sin, both major and minor. Trying to stay away from anything that displeases Allah, especially in these 10 days, whether it is lying or backbiting or anything else. Because sins can block the way to good deeds. And just as istighfar opens the doors to risk, to provision, sins block the doors to risk. And that risk can be material provision because that is what is usually thought of when we say risk. But it can also be inner peace, it can be tranquility, it can be the inclination to perform acts of worship. Sins can deprive a person from all of that. Rasulullah said, a man is deprived of provision because of the sins that he commits. And persisting on a sin, doing it again and again, leaves you desensitized towards that sin until it becomes acceptable in your eyes. So during these 10 days of the hijjah let us make a sincere effort to do the best we can to please Allah and to keep away from the things that would displease Him. We ask Allah to make us. Uh, we ask Allah to make us consistent in our efforts. We ask Allah to help us make the most of these blessed days, and we ask Allah to grant us sincerity in our words and our actions. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-ikhlas wa al-qawli wa al-amal. Now I would like to give. Uh, the mic to Sister Amina to continue. The list of deeds that one can do during these blessed days has not ended yet. And inshallah, I will mention to you a few more of these deeds that we can hold on to in order to maximize our rewards during these blessed days. The next point is the morning and evening adhkar. The morning and evening adhkar are a collection of duas and remembrances which the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to read at these two times. The best time for the morning adhkar is between Fajr and sunrise. And the best time for the evening adhkar is between Asr and sunset. However, if one is unable to recite them during these times, then they can make up for them. For example, if you went back to sleep after the Fajr prayer, then you can make up for them by reading the adhkar immediately as soon as you wake up. This is how the Prophet ﷺ, even while doing mundane things, kept his heart connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one must try to be consistent with these adhkar because it is the fulfillment of a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse 42, and exalt him morning and evening. In addition to this, the adhkars help one to appreciate the greatness of Allah at the best times and thus acquiring the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, you will also be protected from all forms of evil and harm. 
including illnesses, anxiety, grief, depression, devils, evil eye, and magic. Ibn Kathir said, Wear the coat of Athar. It can protect you from the evil of humans and jinn and cover your souls with istighfar so it can erase the sins of night and day. But this is not it. The Prophet ﷺ gave glad tidings of unparalleled reward to those who read the Athar. The virtues of some of the Athar include that all of your sins will be forgiven and if you die on that day or night, you will enter paradise. Ibn al-Qayyim also said, the morning and evening Athar play the role of a shield. The thicker it is, the more its owner won't get affected. Rather, its strength can reach to such an extent that the arrow shot at it will bounce back to affect the one who shot it. Thus, let's try to make our best to make the Athkar an important part of our lives. And let's begin by practicing this habit consistently during these 10 days, inshallah. The next point is sadaqa. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that means that when a person is close to dying, he says about his wealth, وَقَدْ كَانَ لِي فُلَانَ And he makes these statements when he knows that the money already belongs to somebody else. What is he going to do with that now that he is about to die and the soul is about to leave his body? And now he says, well, this is my wealth. Rather, it is no longer his wealth, but it is theirs anyway, because you are about to die. And now you decide to be charitable at the time of death. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not wait up until the soul is about to depart from the body, meaning when you are in the throes of death. And then you decide that you are going to give in charity. Do not wait for that last moment. Rather, the best charity is when you are healthy and you are feeling niggardly and you feel poverty for yourself and you hope for the riches, but at that time you give in charity for the sake of Allah. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 133. And march forth in the way which leads to forgiveness from your Lord and for paradise. Just the heavens and the earth prepared for the muttaqeen. Alladheena yunfiquna fi s-sarra'i wa al-tarra'i wa al-kaadhimeen al-ghayra wa al-aafeen an-nas wallahu yuhibbu al-muhsineen. Those who spend in Allah's cause in the deeds of charity, in prosperity and in adversity, who repress anger and who pardon men. Verily, Allah loves the doers of good. The Prophet ﷺ has also said, And save yourselves from the hellfire, even if it be with the peace of a date. Meaning, it is a small charity, but if it is given correctly with the good intention and a sincere heart for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then one gives and walks away, not seeking from it anything but the pleasure of Allah. Rather, you give and encourage others to do so as well. And this was the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the way of the righteous predecessors. The scholars mentioned that when one gives sadaqah, they give the sadaqah thinking, look at this poor person, or look at what I have done for him. But rather, they don't realize that this wealth that they have given is a loan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a blessing that Allah gave you to test you with. So what you do with it and who will you spend it upon? This is a loan that Allah has given you and it is not a favor that you are doing to others. Rather, it is a favor that Allah has done upon you and Allah expects you to fulfill this trust in the best possible manner. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sadaqa wipes out sins like water extinguishes fire. Also, we need to remind ourselves that sadaqa is a deed that we will continue to benefit from even after we remain no more. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith that the means for a person to attain reward after he dies, after his deeds are cut off, 
and when he will not receive the rewards from any other means, he will continue to receive rewards from three ways. And one of these three ways is an ongoing continuous charity, meaning that the effect of this charity will be continuous even after the from the moment you gave it until after your death and even after that. And the example is that of building a masjid for the sake of Allah. It remains with the slave in the form of a sadhafai jariya even after the servant passes away. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to spend for his pleasure. The next point is being in a state of ablution. Wudu is our ritual purification and it comes out of a larger concept of cleanliness, purity and tahar. What does wudu do? Wudu is a very high level of purity and it protects an individual in many ways. The minute you've broken your wudu, it is not compulsory, but it is highly recommended that you perform your wudu again. It will protect you from a lot of evil and it will keep you steadfast. From several ahadith, it has been emphasized that when a person performs his ablution, it washes away his sins. Uthman bin Affan anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, He who performs ablution well, his sins would come out from his body even coming out from under his nails. In addition to performing wudu, another thing that we must do consistent with it is to recite the dua after performing wudu. The Prophet ﷺ said, if any of you performs ablution and does it well, and when he finishes the ablution, he utters the words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. I bear witness that there is no deity except Allah. He has no associate. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, All the eight doors of paradise will be opened for him, and he may enter through any of them. Indeed, how, greater, indeed, how great an honor that would be. Thus, we must try to be regular with regards to reciting this dua every time we perform wudu. Furthermore, Bilal anh, he went a step further. Once at, a, once at the time of Fajr, the Prophet wasalam, asked Bilal anh, tell me of the best deed you did after embracing Islam, for I heard your footsteps in front of me in paradise. Bilal anh, he said, I did not do anything worth mentioning Except that whenever I performed ablution during the day or night, I prayed after that ablution as much as was written for me. Yes, imagine he prayed after every time that he performed wudu. Indeed, it is not something easy, especially if you bear in mind the fact that you're trying to stay in a state of wudu throughout the day, not just for the five obligatory prayers, but because of this deed. The Prophet وسلم, heard the footsteps of Bilal in front of his own in Jannah. Now, I am not saying that we too must make this a compulsory habit for ourselves, but we must at least try to whatever extent we can, inshallah. And what better opportunity do we have to train ourselves other than these best 10 days of the year? And let's motivate ourselves and remind ourselves that inshallah, even a small effort in these days will help us will help us earn huge rewards, inshallah. Next, sleeping. Sleeping is such a small act that at many times we don't usually consider the fact, we don't consider how much reward we could attain in just performing a few small deeds before we zone out into that state of unconsciousness. So I'd like to mention to you a few sunnas related to sleeping. Firstly, dusting and cleaning one's bed before sleeping. Al-Bukhari and Muslim narrated that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when one of you goes to his bed, let him dust off his bed with the inside of his lower garment, for he does not know what came onto it and after he left it. Then let him say, Rabbi Fa in amsatta nafsi 
وَإِنْ أَرْسَلْتَهَا فَحْفَظْهَا بِمَا تَحْفَظْ بِهِ عِبَادَكَ الصَّالِحِينَ In your name, my Lord, I lie down, and in your name I rise. If you should take my soul, then have mercy on it. And if you should return my soul, then protect it as you protect your righteous slaves. Hence, it is known that dusting down the bed is to be done when one wants to sleep. And it may be done with the edge of one's garment or with something else. Also, when the Prophet ﷺ went to bed, he used to supplicate, saying, Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. O Allah, in your name I die and I live. The Prophet ﷺ used to also place his hands together, both of them, and blow in them, and recite Ayatul Kursi. Uh, sorry, he used to recite Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falaq, and Surah Nas. And then wipe his hands over as much as he could from his body, beginning from his head, face, and then the front part of the body. Is my voice clear, sisters? Am I audible? So, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he used to place his hands together. He used to place his hands together. He used to blow in them and he used to recite Surah Al Ikhlas, Surah Falak, and Surah Nas. And then he used to wipe his hands over as much as he could from his body. He used to begin from his head and then the face and then the front part of the body. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to do this thrice. The next is reading Surah Mulk and Surah Sajda. It was narrated that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a surah from the Quran containing 33 verses will intercede for a man so that he will, for, he will be forgiven. It is the surah, Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadihi al-Mulk. And at Tirmidhi narrated that the Prophet وسلم, did not sleep until he had recited Alif Lam Mi, that is Surah Sajda, and Tabarak al Ladi bi al Mulk, that is Surah Mulk. Another very important act that we must consciously try to imbibe and include in our lifestyle is doing wudu before going to sleep and sleeping in a state of purity. Doing wudu before going to sleep is one of the things which is highly recommended to do before one goes to sleep. A hadith was narrated to this effect, in which the Prophet وسلم, said, when one of you go to bed, do wudu as for prayer. And now we said, if a person has wudu, that is sufficient for him, because the point is to go to sleep having wudu, lest he should die in his sleep so that his dreams will be more true and so that the shaitan will be less likely to play with his dreams and terrify him. The next point is crying out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever wept out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have you ever shed tears out of love, shyness and longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have you ever remembered Allah in solitude and felt embarrassed and ashamed of how much he has favored you with, but you turned away from him? If you did so, then rejoice with glad tidings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in the glorious Quran in Surah Nazi'at, chapter number 79, verse 40 and 41. Wa amma man as for him who feared the position of his Lord and prevented the soul from unlawful inclination, then indeed paradise will be his refuge. It also means that when you read the Quran, when you do a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you reflect upon the verses of the Quran, your eyes well up with tears. Allah says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 109, وَيَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَتْقَانِ يَبْكُونَ وَيَزِيدَهُ 
وَيَزِيدُهُمْ خُشُوعًا And they fall upon their faces weeping, and the Qur'an increases them in humble submission. Imam al-Nawawi said, Weeping while reciting the Qur'an is a sign of the righteous people. And al Hassan al-Basri said, We were informed that whoever weeps out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not a single tear falls down from his eye except that it is a means for him to be freed from the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 58, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ آدَمْ وَمِمَّنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحٍ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْرَائِيلَ وَمِمَّنْ هَدَيْنَا وَاجْتَبَيْنَا وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ الرَّحْمَانِ خَرُّوا سُجَّدًا وَبُكِيًّا Those who were the ones upon whom Allah bestowed His favor from amongst the prophets of the descendants of Adam and those we carried in the ship with Noah and of the descendants of Ibrahim and Israel and of those who we guided and chose. When the verses of the Most Merciful were recited to them, they fell in prostration and weeping. And he also said, if anyone weeps out of the fear of Allah, amongst a group of people, mercy will engulf all of them. And there is no deed except that it has a weight, except the crying out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you want to commit a sin, the fear of Allah stops you. And when you remember the one you were trying to sin against, your eyes filled with tears. One of the greatest blessings that Allah bestows upon his slave is crying out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in that state, you realize that nobody can take care of you except Allah. And that is how Allah grants you the opportunity to be amongst the seven who will be under his shade on the day when there will be no shade except his. Seven people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them his shade on the day when there would be no shade except the shade of his throne. That is on the day of judgment. And they are, and from amongst them is a man who remembers Allah in solitude and his eyes become tearful. Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one who weeps out of the fear of Allah will not enter the hellfire till the milk returns back in the udder and the dust raised on account of fighting in the path of Allah and the smoke of hell will never exist together. This hadith refers to how impossible it is. Yes, one tear. One tear shed out of sincerity and fear of Allah can be your savior from the blazing fire of Jahannam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Two eyes will never be touched by the fire of hell. An eye which weeps out of the fear of Allah and an eye which spends the night in guarding in the cause of Allah. This hadith indicates to us the magnificence of these tears in the sight of Allah. Why does a believer cry? He remembers his negligence and he remembers the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forbearance. This is the weeping that comes out of shyness and love for Allah. When a slave acknowledges his or her shortcomings to Allah, a combination of feeling that makes the heart grow in love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for him alone, such that the soul yearns for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yearns for him. And that is what we need to strive for. The deeds are many more, but we are running out short out of time and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this from us and to allow us to make the best of these 10 days. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to make the best out of these, out of this opportunity that he has granted us. We pray that this was beneficial to all of you and acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the best to accept this opportunity and make the best out of it. Please do keep in touch for our future events and stay blessed, sisters. There was another question that somebody mentioned uh, in the questions where they asked about uh, fasting, the Ramadan fasts in these 10 days. The Ramadan fasts are the compulsory fasts. So if you are going to keep your Ramadan fast in these 10 days, you will not be able to keep it with the intention of fasting, with the niyyah of fasting, the Dhul fast. 
because the Ramadan fast is the compulsory fast and the fast that is compulsory cannot be mixed up with the niyyah of a fast that is a nafil fast. So I hope that answers your question. Jazakallah khair. Wa akhiru dahwana ala alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for all of you to attend the session.